Ideal geography combined with hardworking, innovative people helped Pittsburgh and its suburbs become an industrial powerhouse. Geography provided Pittsburgh strategic and economic advantages that most inland cities could not compete with. Situated at the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela Rivers, which form the Ohio River, Pittsburgh is embedded with the uneven, resource-rich hills of the Appalachian Plateau. This geography was ideally suited to fuel an industrialization of epic proportions. Follow along on this tour of the geography that forged the region's steel empire and explore the geographic hurdles the city and region faces today. Let's also glance at what advantages geography provides the region today. I won't be touching on every detail, but we'll look at the city limits, the suburbs, and the region as a whole. The Forks of the Ohio made Pittsburgh a contested prize during colonial conflicts by the French and British, as control of this river junction granted access to the vast Ohio Valley and routes westward into Native American territories and beyond. The rivers acted as natural interstate highways linking the Midwest and Mississippi River system long before canals or railroads existed, granting Pittsburgh the term Gateway to the West. Western Pennsylvania sat atop one of the richest fossil fuel regions in early American history, allowing Pittsburgh to industrialize earlier and more intensely than most U.S. cities. Pittsburgh lay directly above the Pittsburgh coal seam, one of the thickest, most continuous, and most accessible bituminous coal beds in North America. In many areas, coal seams were exposed along hillsides and riverbanks, allowing for cheap extraction through drift mines rather than deep mine shafts. By the mid-19th century, coal-powered steamboats turned Pittsburgh into one of the nation's largest inland ports and a vital trade link for coal, iron, and manufactured products. Railroads later followed the river valleys, enhancing connectivity, while the hilly terrain necessitated an extensive network of bridges and tunnels. Coal was the single most important resource in Pittsburgh's rise. Coal powered nearly every aspect of Pittsburgh's economy. Just southeast of the city, the Connellsville Coal and Coke region became the most important coke-producing area in the world by the late 19th century. Coal was baked in beehive-shaped ovens that dotted the landscape, creating coke. Connellsville Coke was prized for its purity and strength, making it ideal for blast furnaces. At its peak, the region produced tens of millions of tons of coke annually, feeding Pittsburgh steel mills at an extremely low transportation cost. Rivers and rail lines running through the valleys moved coal and coke directly from mine to mill. This proximity mattered. Steel making is energy intensive and Pittsburgh's ability to source fuel locally rather than shipping it long distances reinforced Pittsburgh's dominance over competitors. Northwestern Pennsylvania was also the birthplace of the global crude oil industry. Oil was struck 75 miles north of Pittsburgh in Titusville. This discovery triggered the world's first oil boom, and Pittsburgh quickly became oil's industrial and financial center. The birthplace of the commercial natural gas industry at the Haymaker Well in Pittsburgh's suburb of Marysville allowed for the creation of the glass industry in Pittsburgh and allowed steel furnaces to use natural gas. Natural gas burns hotter and cleaner than coal, and was cheaper once infrastructure was established. This greatly improved steel quality and efficiency. By the 1880s and 1890s, Pittsburgh steelmakers increasingly adopted natural gas to fire furnaces, heat rolling mills, and power industrial processes. The availability of gas helped Pittsburgh remain competitive even as steelmaking technology advanced. Few cities in the world had coal, coke, oil, and natural gas all within close geographic reach, and fewer could combine them with major river transportation. This resource concentration made the Pittsburgh area uniquely suited to dominate heavy industry, producing 60% of U.S. steel. Pittsburgh's hills helped concentrate development along the rivers, creating dense industrial corridors where mills, rail yards, and worker housing clustered tightly together. Pittsburgh's neighborhoods like Lawrenceville and the Southside Flats grew up right next to the steel mills, factories, and industrial sites along the rivers. Workers needed to live close to their jobs, leading to dense working-class housing, such as distinct bricked row houses found in these areas. This density maximized efficiency, minimized transportation distance, and supported massive employment. Unfortunately, environmental costs and crowding were overlooked because economic output at the time was enormous. Dozens of adjacent towns along the miles of riverfront, such as Aliquippa, Ambridge, Neville Island, 
McKees Rocks, Homestead, Braddock, McKeesport all had mills, industries supporting the mills, and other industry churning away, working together with the resources, rivers, and rails making the area as a whole an industrial powerhouse. During World War II, Pittsburgh's mills and factories churned out ships, armor, Heinz provided rations and built gliders, Rosie the Riveter was created by a Westinghouse artist in Pittsburgh, in 1960, during the Cold War, surface-to-air missile defenses were ringed around Pittsburgh with a radar command center on a hilltop in Oakdale to protect the valuable industry tucked in the valleys around Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's main mills were built between 1875 and 1910. These aging steel mills could not compete with newer advanced mills around the globe which produced cheaper steel on top of a declining need for steel. As a result, Pittsburgh's steel industry declined rapidly in the 1970s and 80s. The steel mills Pittsburgh was known for were closing one by one. The economics changed and the steel industry fizzled out, which devastated families and entire communities. As a result, combined with an aging population, Pittsburgh's population dropped from around 675,000 in 1950 to 300,000 today. Neighboring small towns such as McKeesport lost 30,000 plus residents. The city of Pittsburgh had to take a look at itself in the mirror, clean up its act, and diversify its economy not to rely mostly on heavy manufacturing or choose the same fate of nearby towns. Now let's touch on some of the challenges that Pittsburgh faces due to its geography. Pittsburgh is located on the Allegheny Plateau. Although called a plateau, it is not flat. Over time, rivers and streams have deeply eroded the land, creating steep ravines and rolling hills. The geography makes for picturesque and dramatic landscapes, adding character to each neighborhood. Let's look at the city limits. The topography resulted in 90 neighborhoods. Back in the day, travel and communication was limited between different neighborhoods. This physical isolation and the massive influx of immigrants seeking to work in the industrial sector cemented the ethnic identity of many neighborhoods such as Bloomfield and Polish Hill and allowed distinct neighborhoods to develop their own identities. Since people were walking to the mills, over 700 city staircases, the most in the U.S., were needed to help residents navigate the steep hillsides to and from work. These steps often connect streets and homes where roads weren't feasible. A dozen inclines supplemented the steps at the height of the city's industrial era to move workers and goods up and down the hillsides. Two inclines remain today, mostly as a tourist attraction. Isolated communities like Duck Hollow, tucked away beneath a slag pile, recently required a $3.2 million bridge replacement for a few homes since emergency vehicles could not respond to the community on Duck Hollow's narrow bridge. Cramped conditions on many narrow streets clinging to the hillsides in Pittsburgh require residents to park their vehicles on the sidewalks to allow cars to pass. With 446 bridges in the city limits of all shapes and sizes, Pittsburgh might have more bridges than Venice. Pittsburgh's bridges were a necessity due to the challenging geography. Bridges were quickly and easily produced with the abundance of cheap steel and manpower available. Maintaining these bridges today is now a massive expense that most cities of similar size do not have to deal with. Bridges that once served concentrated industry now burdens the tax base for repair and replacement. The Fern Hollow Bridge collapsed one morning in 2021 after years of neglect. Dozens of more Pittsburgh area bridges are in structurally deficient conditions. With a major lack of funding, Pittsburgh has resulted in preemptively closing bridges or settling for expensive band-aids on bridges that lack the full funding to be replaced, such as the Anderson Bridge repair funded by the federal government. These bridge closures make the traffic problem worse and put a strain on other deteriorating bridges. Over 34% of the land in Pittsburgh is tax exempt, so funding from county, state, and federal sources is routinely required to fix bridges. Pittsburgh's roadways are also costly to build since they often cut into steep hillsides requiring walls and bridges. Once built, they deteriorate more rapidly from salt and nasty freeze-thaw cycles causing potholes. Roadways often go unplowed in the winter as salt trucks are unable to climb or squeeze down certain roadways. Harsh thunderstorms plague Pittsburgh with flooding and landslides eroding many roadways. 
The steep ravines which roadways follow channel flash flooding, wrecking havoc, closing roads, and damaging property. During storms, it is routine for major roadways to close from flash flooding, such as Washington Boulevard, Mifflin Road, and Banksville Road. Typically, once a year, the main river's flood, causing Interstate 376's low point, the bathtub, to submerge, closing Pittsburgh's main thoroughfare. When the roadways are open, two interstate tunnels bottleneck the city from west to east. Multiple lanes and ramps combine before the tunnels and then narrow to two lanes inside the tunnels. Road widening is limited by the aging infrastructure and topography, which prevents more lanes from being added. The tunnels in Route 28 squeezing along the river and hillsides make traffic in a city with a relatively small population feel much worse during rush hour and sporting events. There's no long-term plans to widen any tunnels. The state is banking on an eventual completion of a southern beltway, which would take westbound traffic on I-376 near Monroeville, a roundabout way avoiding the two tunnels and connect with I-79, and then back with I-376 at the airport. All for an expensive one-way toll price attempting to justify the required massive bridge spans and earth moving. To the left of the Squirrel Hill Tunnel is one of the only major neighborhoods constructed in Pittsburgh city limits in the last 20 years. The Somerset neighborhood is a planned community built by leveling out an old slag dump. Pittsburgh does not have the ability to create new subdivisions easily, such as a flat city like Columbus or Orlando, which is expanding without hilly geography constraints. Most residential development in Pittsburgh has been in the form of apartments, whether converting old factory lofts or demolishing to build new. Pittsburgh's hilly terrain causes limited space to build new. This lack of brand new or newer single-family homes leads many to look outside the city limits to the suburbs, such as Cranberry Township to the north, Venetia to the south, airport area communities to the west with their more manageable terrain allowing for newer, larger homes, safe communities, and less traffic headaches. Another problem is the political geography. Pennsylvania has over 2,500 different municipalities resulting in no unincorporated land for expanding communities. Because of this, there is little to no coordination between neighboring municipalities, which results in redundant and sometimes subpar public services. Unless a township or borough dissolves control to Pittsburgh, there will be no future expansion of Pittsburgh's boundaries. The resource extraction and industrial processes that occurred in the Pittsburgh region was intense. When the mills and mines closed, they left behind environmental scars. Mine subsidence collapses homes, Waste coal piles and mines leach abandoned mine drainage, poisoning aquatic life. The largest waste coal pile east of the Mississippi River is located near Imperial, containing 40 million tons of waste coal in an enormous man-made mountain. The open pits of coal strip mines were routinely filled with garbage, fly ash from power plants, and toxic waste from the steel mill industry. The Senko Seep, also in Imperial, is where hazardous steel mill acids were dumped in a strip mine and is one of hundreds of sites in the Pittsburgh area that buried toxic waste. The geography was convenient for midnight dumping and burying of toxic waste. Even the Mays family is associated with hazardous waste trucking in Robinson Township. A steel mill byproduct called slag was dumped in nearby valleys creating man-made mountains. Pittsburgh was also known as Radium City and the birthplace of the American nuclear industry leaving behind radioactive waste sites such as Cannonsburg and Numec. Most industrial flat land along the rivers called brownfields require expensive cleanups before new development can start. Sites requiring the highest level of cleanup are Superfund sites. One Superfund is now a university athletic center on Neville Island. Abandoned oil and gas wells in western Pennsylvania require costly locating and plugging to prevent methane gas emissions. Fortunately, over the years, numerous efforts to clean up the remnants of the industrial past have taken place. Lastly, let's touch upon the weather. Pittsburgh is gloomy most of the year. This location in the mid-Atlantic causes the city to average over 200 cloudy days per year, rivaling Seattle. Pittsburgh is positioned in line to be hit by almost all the storms crossing the Midwest. Just to the north, cold air sweeping over Lake Erie often parks over Pittsburgh in western Pennsylvania for long periods of time. 
the Laurel Highlands to the east causes a second cloud generator that often traps overcast conditions even after storm fronts have passed. It takes a while for summer to arrive in Pittsburgh after having what feels like nine months of winter and wetness. When the sun does come out, Pittsburgh can feel like a different city because the sun is so elusive. Pittsburgh's geography was great for making steel. Now, there's no steel mills left in the city limits, but U.S. Steel still has a large presence along the Monongahela River. So what else is booming in the Pittsburgh area today? When Pittsburgh reimagined itself, it diversified the economy to not rely solely on heavy manufacturing. Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh are two major anchors in the city limits investing in EDS and MEDS. CMU is a leading research institution with AI, autonomous vehicles, and robotics, pulling in startups to Pittsburgh and pulling talent from around the world. Because of this, Apple, Google, Meta, Caterpillar, Hitachi, Bombardier, space companies, drone companies, and numerous autonomous vehicle companies are here. The University of Pittsburgh has a long legacy of medical innovations, such as the development of the polio vaccine, and has patients coming to Pittsburgh from around the country for advanced medical procedures. There's still nuclear research, chemical companies, biomed, and more. And then you have the major sports teams that generate a lot for the city. Riverfronts around the region still have big and small industrial sites utilizing the rivers and rail. The Army Corps is upgrading the locks and dams which shows the importance of the river connections. The same industrial sites that once had steel and other industries are being redeveloped into new manufacturing and technology hubs. The Pittsburgh region is in the nation's largest power grid with a massive abundance of natural gas from the Marcellus Shale. An enormous amount of natural gas infrastructure has sprung up in the region to transport and process. Billions are being invested in the region's old coal-fired power plants to convert them to natural gas to power AI data centers. Even the nuclear power plant is revving up to sell meta-electricity. The riverfront brownfields that once had smoky steel mills now have developers eyeing them for AI data centers. Once again, Pittsburgh's geography is pulling in an industry. With a coal climate, abundant river water for coaling, natural gas for powering servers, close connections to major population centers, and top hardworking talent from the nearby universities and trades. Will the AI data centers go bust like the steel industry? Or are we just racing to build data centers that will eliminate enormous amounts of office jobs, destroying what's left of downtowns all over the USA?